Now the way to write the optimization problem, let me um, get to the slides which I started showing before. Yeah, can we, uh, okay, we go back. In the morning lecture, we had this, right? Sorry, this one. So, you have to write it in this format. First, first statement should be minimize or maximize f x. In this case, minimize cost, you can say f as a function of w comma d, write down the expression. So, f w comma d equal to the expression given here and then below you write subject to g 1 w comma d equal to the first constraint greater than equal to 10,000 I think and then the g 2 and g 3 and then write the variable bounds. Is that clear? Okay. So, let me try to do it here because we have a technology here. So, minimize f w comma d okay, equal to what is the expression given? 200 w plus 100 d. Okay. Now, next line you like subject to all the constraints. So, the first constraint is g 1 as a function of w comma d equal to what is that constraint? Somebody tell, tell me w times d greater than equal to 10,000, but see the way it should be written is greater than equal to 0. The right hand side is always 0. So, I will bring the 10,000 this side greater than equal to 0. Is that okay? And then G 2, what is G 2? So, tell me in that format W by D minus 2 is less than equal to 0 and G 3. W by D minus half equal to 0. And what are the constraints uh, variable bounds? 0 less than equal to W less than equal to 100 and 0 less than equal to D less than equal to 200. Okay. Notice one thing we are deviating from the nonlinear programming I told you is that this sign has to be greater than equal to, right? but one of them is less than equal to. So, I will rewrite this or I will rewrite g w g 2 w d as equal to, how do I convert it to a greater than equal to? Multiply both sides by minus 1. So, it will be 2 minus w by d greater than equal to 0. So, my g 2 is actually 2 minus w by d okay? and g 3 is already in greater than equal to form, g 1 is already in greater than equal to form. Okay. So, now we are not going to solve this problem, but this task was to just identify and formulate the problem as an optimization problem. So, this part I have been talking about in the, in the morning class is that this takes about 50 to 60 percent of the effort. It is not, in this problem it is simple, but this is where you have to bring in all your domain knowledge for uh, objectives and constraints. Yeah. In optimization, there is nothing like strictly greater than 0 or strictly less than 0. Usually, it takes into account the 0 also, because when you say strictly greater, how much is it away from 0? So, is it 0 0.001 or 0 0.0001? So, usually it is the equality sign is always included in the constraint. So, it says at least 10,000 means 10,000 or more, right? It should be at least at most 200 meter, for example. That means 200 or less. So, it is always like that. Sorry, which one are you saying? Yeah, it can be 0, but then the constraints will satisfy. Now that there are constraints, they will not satisfy. So, take w equal to 0, d equal to 0 and put it on the first constraint. So, then you have 0 here, 
and minus 10,000 can never be greater than equal to 0. So that value of w equal to 0, d equal to 0 is not a feasible solution. So it cannot be an optimum solution. So this can come on the way of your optimization, but this will not be your final result. But if you don't have a constraint, then w can be 0, d can be 0. And if you don't have a constraint, that could be your solution. right? So constraint come and says such a trivial solution cannot be your optimal solution. You should have some area inside. If you have w equal to 0, d equals to 0, there is no area inside. So that's not allowed. So Any other question? Hmm. Because I don't, I don't have this constraint. Hmm. But practically, it cannot be equal to 0, and it makes no sense. Right. So that means you have done something wrong, or something you've not included in your optimization problem. Then you realize, why did it become 0? So I need a constraint that will not allow it to be 0. And then you realize, oh, I need to put a minimum area constraint that will not make any of the dimensions 0. So sometimes, this is a simple one, but sometimes even in complex problems, engineering problems, when we solve it using an optimization algorithm, we find such trivial results. May not be such things, but some other thing. I'll give you an example. So I, we worked with Tata Motors in Pune. So there was a suspension. I showed you the car. That is the problem we did. So they described us the whole problem. There are a number of variables. We came and solved the problem. We didn't get 0 anywhere, but we got a solution. And we went to them to show it. And the person who was working with us there, he said, give me one minute. And he went to his office, did something with that solution. He said, no, this is not acceptable to us. So I said, why not? Then he says, you know, we have the front natural frequency and rear natural frequency. Front natural frequency should be smaller, I think, than the rear natural frequency for pitching motion to die down. Okay, so this is something in-house developed knowledge that they have. They always use it in design. <coughs> but he hasn't told me that before. And an optimization algorithm has no way of knowing that this is something that the practice of, of Tata, Tata Motors, right? So I said, oh, you have to tell me that. I will then go and put as a constraint. So in front of him, I added that as a constraint and ran on my laptop. And then I gave him, he said, I need one more minute. So he went, I mean, this is something secret, how he computes those things. He never tells me. Um, but I used the, the natural frequency formula that we know usually. <coughs> but fortunately, that was something that you, they were using a very similar one, but they were using a crude version of that. But it satisfied his constraints. And he said, yeah, this is acceptable to me. So I said, yes, all you have to do is tell me what are the things you need to satisfy in your solution, and I will put them as constraint. So optimization is never done in one step. You do something, you get something, and then you say, oh, this something is missing, because I am not supposed to get such results. Because it's still a math problem. When you formulated this, now, if you give this to me, I don't know what is w, what is d you are talking about. This problem is gone from me. Now the algorithm looks at this and gives you the optimal solution. Now, that one, if 0, 0 is a solution of that, that's a solution of this. It's not a solution of your problem. So have you got the formulation done properly from your problem? That's your responsibility. Okay. So that's why I always say an optimization algorithm is finding the optimum of your model, whatever math formula you've written here, the model. It's not solving your original problem. If you have done a mistake here, you will get a wrong answer. So you need to make sure. And oftentimes, you don't know. So you come back, solve it, and you realize, ah, something is missing. Then you add that, and then you rerun. And this can go on for a few iterations before you are happy, and the person you are working it for is happy, and then you have a solution. Is that clear, the process? OK. Uh, let's move to the next one, then. Again, read it. Read the question first. It's a little long problem. And then we'll discuss again.
Okay, after you have read it one time, it is not enough to remember everything. So, what you have to do is make some kind of a sketch to understand. So, let me start with you. Um, so, here the first line says a large steel corporation has two iron ore reduction plants. Okay. So, there is a reduction plant R 1 and so let me try to draw here. Let me so, there are two plants. So, let me draw it this way. Let us say this is my R 1 and this is my R 2. Okay. I will put a index a small r equal to 1 and small r equal to 2. So, small r indexes which reduction plant it is. So, I have got two reduction plants R 1 and R 2. Each of these plants processes iron ore into two different ingot stocks. So, now I need two different ingot stocks. So, let us have another block here saying this is let us say in a different way I am doing s equal to the stock 1, s equal to 1 and s equal to 2 is the second stock. So, there are two ingot stocks it is it's producing or rather processing. Yeah. Now, so uh, you can get now from this R 1 plant you can get the processing of ingot 1 and also processing of ingot 2. right? Similarly, R 2 second plant you can also process the ingot to S 2 or also to S 1. All right. So, let me just say here that we supply here on top some amount of ingots that are coming. I think that is what you have to find later on, but these are coming and whatever ingot you are supplying some of it is going uh, some of it is processing S 1 and some of it is processing for S 2 and the same in the other way. Okay. Then they are shipped to uh, three, diff, uh, three fabricate any of three fabricating plants where they are made into either of the two stocks. So, so there are three fabricating plants. So, let me put it this way. Let us say there is another thing I come up with three of them here. Okay. Let us call them fabricating plant 1, fabricating plant 2, fabricating plant 3. Okay. Now, here this one comes out and goes to all three of them. This one comes out goes to all three of them. Okay. And then they are shipped to these fabricating plants which they are made into either of two uh, finished products. So, now I have some finished products here. Let us call that P 1 equal to 1, P equal to 2. Okay. So, this one is can come from here all the three places and this one can come from all the three places. Okay. And that is how you get something out from this. So, this is my network that you can see. So, there are there are so R 2 here are the, pro, are the reduction plants. So, let us write it here reduction plant and these are producing two ingot stocks. They are processing rather ingot stocks and these are fabricating plants and these are finished product. So, when you when you go and talk to some industry and they describe you the problem they would just give you such statements which is written here. So, you need to come back in your office and try to understand how the flow of the whole material is. So, you need to produce sometimes such, such block block diagrams. Okay, Let us continue. In total there are two reduction plants let us check two reduction plants R equal to 1 and 2, two ingot stocks S equal to 1 and 2, three fabricating plants F equal to 1, 2, 3 and uh, two finished products P equal to 1 and P equal to 2. Okay. So, the first paragraph is done. For the coming season, the company wants to minimize the total tonnage of iron ore processed in its reduction plant. So, what is the iron ore process? So, the total coming to R 1 and total coming to R 2, this is the thing and I do not know how much is that. So, I need to I need to minimize the total sum here. So, what are my variables now? Okay, so, I can assume that let us say x 1 is being sent here and x 2 is being sent here because these are the things I do not know. 
So, what is my objective function? Minimize x1 plus x2. Okay? These are the two things I do not know, but whatever they are, they are some I have to minimize. Okay. Okay. Subject to, now the constraints are coming in production and demand constraints stated below. So, the a, b, c, d, e, these are the constraints that are given to us. So, in this problem, objective was easy and first told, so I am writing that is why. And then the constraints are coming, so I can write the constraints later. Formulate the design optimization problem and transcribe it into standard nonlinear programming format. So, like we have done before. So, let us see if we can write down the constraints here. Okay. So, here are the constraints. First one, A, the total tonnage of iron ore processed by both reduction plants okay, must be equal to the tonnage processed into ingot stocks for shipment to the fabricating plants. So, what does it mean? Total tonnage of iron ore processed by both reduction plants. Well, R is an R is an index, so I need to write something now here. So that means whatever is x1 coming in, some part of it is going to s equal to one, and some part is going to s equal to two, right? And look at the nomenclature table here given. A R comma s actually says the tonnage yield of ingot stock s from 1 ton of iron ore processed at reduction plant R. So, what is A 1 comma 1 mean? If I say this quantity A 1 comma 1, what does it mean? So, R equal to 1, S equal to 1. That means, tonnage yield of ingot stock 1 from 1 ton of iron ore processed at reduction plant 1. So, the iron ore processed in the reduction plant 1 is x 1. So, if 1 ton of was processed, you would you would get here uh, a 1 comma 1. So, if you x 1 is produced, how much do you get here? a 1. So, this will be a 1 comma 1 times x 1, right? Do you agree? That much proportion of x 1 is coming on to a s equal to 1. And then what is a 1 comma 2? Is this one here a 1 comma 2 times x 1. Is that clear? It is this one that is coming to a s equal to 2. Then this is similarly a 2 comma 2 x 2 and this is a 2 comma 1 x 1 or 2 x 2 because it is coming from 2. Is that okay? All right. Now, ideally a 1 comma 1 should be equal to 1 minus a 1 comma 2 ideally, but I have not given you any number here, but assuming that these are known a 1 comma 1 is known a 1 comma 2 is known all these are known here, all these quantities in that table are known to you, will be given to you, but they could be some up to 1 or they need not be. If they are need, if they need not be, there is some loss, okay, because there are some can be at most 1 or less than 1. So, that depends on whatever are the values given. Okay. So, the first part now, so can we then, um, so how can we write then the, the A now? How can we write A, the constraint A? What will be constraint A? Summation of which one? A11 yeah, one one X1 one plus A12 X2, no, A21 X2. A21 X2. So, the net that is coming to A is equal to 1, what is that going to be? So, that is the sum process by the reduction plants, no reduction plants must be equal to the total tonnage process into ingot stocks for shipment to the. So, that means, if I call this now let us say y 1 whatever is processed at s 1 and y 2 is what is processed as s equal to 2, then can we write this that a 1 1 a 1 comma 1 times x 1 plus a 2 comma 1 times x 2 should be equal to y 1. Okay, so, that means, there is no loss in this place. So, this is the first constraints I can write 1 comma 1 x 1 plus a 2 comma 1 x 2 is equal to y 1. Okay? Is that right? Okay. 
Any question? Hmm. Okay, have you read the constraint? First read the constraint. So, whatever is coming to s equal to 1, there is no loss, they are being produced, they are being processed. So, if you now call what is coming out of s equal to 1 is y 1, y 1 should be equal to the net input. So, net input to s equal to 1 is same as the output. Okay. Now, y 1 gets distributed into 3 different things. Again, I do not know how much of each of them is distributed. So, let us say, let us say we call these as um, y 1 1. So, let me call these as y y y 1 1 and the next one is y 1 2 and third one is y 1 3. So, from 1 s equal to 1 to f equal to 1 amount going is let us say y 1 1. s equal to 1 to f equal to 2 let us say y 1 2 and s equal to 1 to f equal to 3 is y 1 3. Okay? So, because I do not know how much they are as soon as you do not know something you assume that as a variable. Okay? Is that right? So, same thing you can do for y 2. So, this will be y 2 1, y 2 2 and y 2 3. Okay? Again I do not know these quantities. Okay. Now, what can we write? So, can we write? So, here is another equation I did not write. Right? That is for the s equal to 2. I did not write that, but I hope you can write it. Okay. Then we are going to the next stage. So, now can I write y 1 is equal to y 1 2 y 1 1 sorry plus y 1 2 plus y 1 3 because whatever y 1 is coming it is getting distributed into 3 parts. Similarly, you can write for y 2 yeah you can write it. Okay. Now, let us read this b the total tonnage of iron ore processed by each reduction plant cannot exceed its capacity. Okay, so, how do you put that? What is the capacity? Now, you have to go and see the capacity. Look at the k bracket f, the, the second last row in the table. Capacity of fabricating plant f in tonnage for all stock. So, that is given to us. So, k 1 is going to be what? K 1 is the capacity of the fabricating plant 1. Oh, sorry, this is this is not the capacity. This is yeah, yeah. C C R is given as the capacity of the reduction. So, we have to see that. So, C 1 is going to be the total tonnage, uh, sorry, iron ore processing capacity in tonnage at reduction plant R 1. Okay. So, how can we write the C's now? So, look at the look at my diagram. So, I know C 1 is the maximum capacity of reduction plant 1. So, how it is that how x 1 is less than C 1. So, x 1 will be less than equal to always okay? C 1 uh, 1 and all the C sorry C bracket 1 uh, all these C's are given to you C 1 C 2 are some numbers given to you. Similarly, you can write x 2 less than equal to C 2. So, this is taken care of B, constraint B and all these things are taken care of over here and also the next one you can call it at A because the next one follows from the first one that we written. Okay? Now, let us read C. The total tonnage of ingot stock manufactured into products at each fabricating plant okay, must be equal to the tonnage ingot stock shipped to it by its reduction plant. Okay, so, um, what is that that we have here now with the yeah. So, we need to see um, manufactured into products. So, we need to also we need to also specify here something. So, let us call this Z maybe Z 1 1 and Z 1 2. Z 2 1 and Z 2 2, Z 3 1 and Z 3 2. Okay. Now, let us see. Okay. Okay. 
So what is the net thing coming to a fabricating plant? Let's say fabricating plant 1, it is y11 plus y12, right? That's the net thing that's coming. Okay, and how much is this going out? Z11 plus Z12. So all the C is saying is the total tonnage of ingot stock manufactured into products at each fabricating plant must be equal to the tonnage ingot stock shipped. So that means the C comes as Y11 plus Y12 should be equal to Z11 plus Z12, right? Can you write the other two? Y12 plus Y22 will be equal to Z21 plus Z22, yeah? So you opposite? I'm sorry. Y13. No, no, no. Net thing coming to the fabricating plant. What is the net? Is this wrong or correct? That's correct. What is the next one? We write for the fabricating plant 2 now. Okay, so what is the net coming to fabricating plant 2? Is y12 plus y22 equal to what? Whatever is going out. Hmm. All this is saying is there is no loss in this fabricating plant. And then the third one is y13 plus y23 equal to, that is the net thing coming to F3 and going out is Z31 plus Z32 from the from the F equal to 3. Is there any confusion? Y11 plus Y12, these are coming in or what? Oh, sorry, Y21, that was the confusion, okay. So I wrote it here, I thought this is that. So Y21 is this, that's right, Y21, you are right, okay. So that is the C. What is the D now? D is the capacity of the fabricating plant. So fabricating plant F equal to 1 has a capacity K1, okay, and fabricating plant 2 has a capacity of K2. These are given to you. So what can we say now? So the capacity of F1. So what is the total processing? Either Y11 plus Y21 or Z11 plus Z12. I can write it because this equation is already here. So let me write with any one of them, left or right side, doesn't matter. That should be what? Less than equal to, not equal to. That's this capacity should be equal to K1. Okay. Similarly, what's the other one? Z21 plus Z22. 2, 2 should be less than equal to K2 and one more Z31 plus Z32 should be less than equal to K3, okay. All right, now we have one last one E. The total tonnage of each product must be equal to its demand. Demand is given here as D, capital D. Uh, so, for the finished product P equal to 1, demand is D1 ton and finished product P equal to 2, the demand is D2, that is what you want. So, I can go and put here as my demand D1 here and D2 here. This is what we want to get at the end, all right. So, what shall I write as E now? So, how much are we getting? Okay. So, Z11 plus Z21 plus Z31 should be equal to D1. Why it is not less than equal to? It's a, that is what we want exactly. We do not want one ton more or one ton less. We want exactly D1. Similarly, you can write the other one Z12 plus Z22 plus Z32 should be equal to D2. Okay, these are the five constraint sets. Okay, any variable bound okay before that we haven't we've done it little in a in a different order here we haven't identified the variables first right because in this problem whatever we didn't know we put a variable like x1 x2 like y1 y2 that like y11 y12 all these are variables x y and z z right all these are variables 
So, let us write down what are the variables. So, our variables here is x 1, x 2, then y 1, y 2, then y 1 1, y 1 2, y 2 1, y 2 2. Oh, there is one more I left y 1 3 and y 2 3. Okay? And then z 1 1, z 1 2, z 2 1, z 2 2, z 3 1 and z 3 2. Is there anything else? Sorry? No, D1, all these in the table here are given to you, supplied to you. Demand is known. Okay? Demand is known that I want so much ton at the end. If you do not do that, so it is saying that at the end of this whole process, I want to get so much finished product copy, so much tonnage of finished products of one type and of two types so much. It is given to you. Now, tell me with all these parameters, what x 1 and x 2, what x 1 plus x 2, what is the minimum number of raw material I have to supply to produce that much finished product. Finished product, what I want, I have told you, I want that much. Now, in that process, there are some losses there are some equalities, how much minimum I have to supply as a raw material, that is the problem. Yeah, right? Okay. Yeah, each of them has to be greater than or equal to 0, do not forget the equal to, some of them can be 0 as well. So, this whole vector here is greater than equal to 0, each element is greater than equal to 0, that is my variable bound and these are all variables. So, let us count how many variables you have got, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So, 16 variables. Okay. So, this is the formulation of the problem. So, I have the objective function to be minimized and all these constraints to be satisfied. So, that is the first step. And now, in this problem, I really do not need 16 variables. right? So, let us see, let us go a little further and investigate. So, there is some pre processing that is needed. After you have got that, you can pre process, make it as a very succinct optimization problem so that your algorithm you are not giving too much trouble to work on. So, how can we reduce? So, how can we reduce number of variables? What variables can I reduce out of the 16? By equality. By equality yeah. Okay. So, which one? Can you suggest me one? Z1 to Z1 to By what? So, you mean Y11 is equal to Z11? No. Okay, yeah, I can do that. But there are some simple, other simple things we can do. What is that? See, y1 is getting splitted into y11 plus y12 plus y13, and I have a constant in A that says y1 is equal to y11 plus y12 plus y13. So, I really do not need y1, right? If you give me y11, y12, and y13, I know y1. So, I do not have to keep that as another variable and give the pressure on the algorithm to make sure that y 1 is also variable, other 3 are also variable and they have to be equal. right? So, y 1 I can take out, y 2 I can take out and substitute y 1 equal to these 2 I can I use to, to reduce the variables from 16 to 14. Okay. Then you are suggesting some other. right? Okay. So, what can we do? We can do much better than that. What can we do? Okay, you have to look at the inequality constraints, right? So, what are the equality constraint? So, we have y11 plus y21 is z11 plus z12. Like what he said, we can eliminate, let's say, z12, and I can also eliminate like that z22. So, let's cut those out. So, z1, z I said z12, I can cut. Z22 I can take out, Z32 I can take out. So, I have taken 3 more out using these 3 equations here, the C equations. Okay? So, everywhere I have Z, Z12, I can write Y11 plus Y21 minus Z11. Right? So, I have reduced from 16 now to how much? 11, right? 5 are reduced from 16. So, I have 11, 11 left. Can I do some more? Yeah. What more can I do? 
I have these two equity equality conditions as well. Okay. So as I said, Z12, Z12 is appearing here. So I can replace with that, and then Z22, Z32. These are these can be replaced with C equations, right? Okay. But these ones I cannot do anything. Okay. So now these will be functions of what? Y11 and all these quantities here, the six numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also Z11 and Z12 will be there. So I can reduce one more variable by using this condition and one more variable by using that condition. So I can choose any one of them from here and any one of them from here. So this 6 will be there. I can choose any one of them. Let us say I choose Z11. So I take that out. And from this, uh, I could choose Z1, uh, I could choose Z1 is already chosen, I could choose Z31 or something. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I have got these two equations and I can reduce two more variables with that. That is what I mean. These two equality constants, I can two more. I have the liberty to choose now any two of those. So, let us say I have taken Z11 and Z31. Okay. So, that means 9 are left now. Because there is an equality constraint, I can keep one of them on the left side, I put rest all on the right side. That is how we did here also, Z12, I kept it on the left side and Z11, I put it on the right side, the other way here, right. Same thing, as soon as you have equality constraint linear, you can substitute one of the variables. That is the nice thing about linear constraints if you have, okay. So 9, is there anything we could do, anything more we could do? So I have got three equations here, I have reduced the three variables, I have got two equations here. So I have got 5 reduction and then y went into 7 total reduction from 16, so I have got 9. I do not think you can do any further, right, because there is no other equality. This is a equality constraint, but I do not know anything about x1, x2, all that stuff, right. Oh, we have not done that, right. Where does the b is coming from? Maybe you can reduce some more then. Let us see what is B. Total yield from 1 ton of ingot stock S shipped to the fabricating plant F okay, and manufactured into product P. So let me write one of them. So what is actually says the relationship between Z11 and Y11 and so Z11 is equal to how much is how much of that is coming from Y11 and how much of it is coming from uh, Y21. Okay. So it says B 1 comma 1 comma 1 let us write that first b 1 comma 1 comma 1 okay that is saying total yield from 1 ton of ingot stock s equal to 1 okay shipped to fabricating plant f equal to 1 and went into the manufacturing product p right so z11 is actually b11 times y11 so, if 1 ton was coming as Y11, how much do you get as Z11? That is what the B says. Now, since I am getting Y11 instead of 1 ton, I have to multiply B1, 1, 1 with Y11. That much is my Z11. But there is another way I can get Z11 also, right? From 2, 1, from the second one. And that is what? B2 now, S equal to 2, comma 1, comma 1 times Y21. Is that clear? So, what the bees are saying is that if you take a fabricating plant, there are two sources. The ingot can come from S equal to 1 or S equal to 2. So, B 1 comma 1 comma 1 is ingot 1 processed at fabricating plant 1 and producing the first finished product 1. If you have 1 ton input coming to the F, what you get as an output is B 1 comma 1 comma 1. So, because we are sending y11, so y11 times b1, 1, 1, 1 is z11. But that is not all because z11 is also coming from s equal to 2. So, that again is b2, 1, 1 because second ingot processing at first plant and then producing the first product. So, their total sum is our z11. Okay? Now, can you write the other things? z 
um, 1, 2. So there will be all these other terms z, 2, 1 and all these 6 terms you can write now all of them like this. Okay. All right. So once you have written all that, now you see you get an additional relationship now because all the b's are given to you, b11, b21, all these are given to you. So this is a linear combination. Again, I can replace z11 with this term, and z12 with that term, and so on and so forth. I can replace all of that. Right? Okay. So I've already got these replacements over here with this thing that I said. Instead, of what I could have done. I could take all these six equations here and replace. I cut all of them here. And z11, I'm writing as a function of y11 and y12. z12, I can write as a function of y11, y whatever are the y's here. So everything can be written as a function of y's. All right. Now these equations then can also be written in terms of y's, and I get an additional two equations. So I'm going to keep these two equations. Okay. So keep them but replace all of these here. All the z's are replaced by them. So let us call these, I do not have numbers for it uh, because this is just comes from the definition. So we will just say definition of b's, b um, s comma f comma p. Okay. From the definition of b s comma f comma p, I can write all this and now z11, z12, everything can be replaced in terms of y11, y12. So I am cutting all of that here and y1, y2 I already cut. So I can actually reduce down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 variables, okay? knowing that there are two equality constraints, which I can actually reduce to more of these, okay? but I can keep them or I can reduce it to 6 variables. And then I have these constraints, so I need to keep. So let me use another color here, the things that I am keeping. So I am keeping this. I am keeping this and this is already taken care of right or not. Uh, no, this is not taken care of, so I have to keep them also. Keep and these ones are taken care of, so I need to keep this okay? as constraints. Keep means I am keeping them as constraints. So then I have, if I am keeping all of them, then I have 8 variables and these are the 8 variables x1, x2, y11, y12, y21, y22, y13 and y23. So then I can form the optimization problem and try to solve it. If I want, I can reduce even as I said 2 more variables, then I am not going to keep this because this is already considered and then I have the rest of the things to keep. So I have reduced my problem by 2 more variables and that you will probably see it is little faster to solve because you have less number of variables. So is that process clear of how, so in, in, in a problem from an industry or talking to some people that, that you are trying to solve or it could be your problem from thesis you are getting from a problem from a paper of a journal and you read it and you figure out this is what is going on and then you try to formulate it as, a, as an optimization problem, this is what you have to do understand each and every process, what is the flow and whatever is unknown, keep that as a variable and let the optimization algorithm find it for you. Okay. So let me try to, yeah, you have a question? This part? So this part comes from what I just told you, the definition of B. That part is clear or not? How do we get Z? Okay, now the question is, that how do I reduce my variable? So you see on, in these equations z11 is on the left hand side and, the, and they are functions of y's. Right? So that means this is clearly I can replace z11 with y's. So that is why I have taken away all those, there will be 6 equations here, all the 6 variables I have taken out as derived variables because I, can, I do not need to keep them as variables. As soon as I keep y11, y21 as a variable, z11 gets fixed. If I keep it z11 also as a variable, now there is a additional constraints I have that this has to be satisfied. right? Um, and then my algorithm has to figure out that this is true 
and then so it takes a lot of time for the algorithm to figure that out. But it is a linear equations I see so I can always replace my variable z11 with this. So all the 6 variables will go away okay? and y1, y2 already went away because y1 was equal to y11 plus y12 plus y, y what was that 1 2 plus y 1 3 I think. Yeah, so all these were there and so I can eliminate. So basically 6 plus 2 8 out of 16 went away 6 of the variables remain but then all these constraints that I said keep here has to be there also as constraints because I have not taken them into account when I have reduced this. Then I said that you can even reduce 2 more variables make it 6 variables. If you want to do that trick, we said that these equality constraints can also be used to reduce two more variables. Okay. So, any other question? Okay. Now, um, I've actually solved that problem for particular values of. Let me see if I can have this up on the screen. Um, display management meter. Okay. Now. Yeah, we can see that I need to do is reduce this now. Where is the reduction? This one I can do. Huh, it's not coming very well. But anyway, let me show you how this structure looks like. Okay, this is exactly what we have done right and it goes on and all these constraints I have written with the variables which you also have. Uh, then I have reduced it a little bit in this case and I optimized it using a linear program because it's all every objective function and constraints are linear here right. So, it is an ideal problem for linear programming and you see the optimal solution we get the optimal. So, d 1 and d 2 are supplied right these are the things you want to get in order to find the optimal it says x 1 should be 0 because it is very costly or whatever are these numbers you need a that process is not very optimal process. So, it turned out that you do not produce anything from r equal to 1 r equal to yeah, one side. So, everything comes from r equal to 2 and then there are many other things. So, you see it is getting broken up into 2. So, maybe I can make this bigger and just discuss this. Yeah, so, let us look at that first. So, this much x 2 you need and then it gets splitted into these 2. Now, you see they are not summing up to be 1, right? but these are given this 0 0.42, 0 0.46 these are given to us. This is a 1 comma a 2 comma 1 and n 2 comma 2 these are given. Their sum is less than 1 which means that there is a loss in the system, but that is okay. whatever is given. And then I need both s 1 and s 2 and but I do not need y 2 you see there is nothing here that y 2 uh, sorry not y 2 here y 1 2 that turned out to be 0 when I optimize it. Okay. It all in the number all these table that are given to you if you change those numbers you will have a different optimal solution, but for the given number that I have used this one is not needed this one is not needed this one is not needed. Okay. So, everything comes from here only gets supplied to f 2 this one gets splitted into 2 that is the optimal way of doing it, but everything is producing and then you meet the demand this is the optimal way of doing it. Now, first time you look at this and you you will have some suspicion right. So, something is missing it has become 0 then you go to the person and say hey this is what I am getting do you think it makes sense. Well, then you have to go through again with the person and see if everything you have got is all right and the person also may not know because they may not know what is the optimal solution. So, if everything formulation is correct you discuss again everything you are fine then that is the result. right? Now, you can make some sensitivity analysis which we will talk about later, uh, which means that I am going to go and change the demand let us say by, um, by a small amount. I am going to change the demand by let us say 1 percent more and rerun the whole process and then I want to see how the result is. So, what do you expect if I make this 1 percent more let us say? You want your x 2 to be more right? because it has to supply little more now. But rest of the thing do you expect it to be completely different? Because it is a real valued problem. So, if you change your parameters by a small amount you expect your solutions to also, also change small amount. But now if you see you get a completely different result now x 1 has to be brought in 
and much more stuff is coming from x1, then you think that neither of them is correct. Neither this one is correct or maybe what I did with 1 percent more in demand is also not correct. Then you have to suspect your formulation, suspect your optimization algorithm. Everything becomes suspicious after that. But if you see consistency that yes, I can predict that this has happened, I increased 1 percent, every x2 has increased by 1 percent, everything has gone up by little more, little more, then you think yeah, it, it's, it is following it, right? That could be true. Um, so there are various ways to test your formulation and the problem and the algorithm that you are running. Here we are running linear programming that's known to be giving you always the optimal solution. So you don't have to suspect the algorithm. The only thing you can suspect here is the problem formulation, whether you've got that right or not. Okay. So uh, this this one, when you now when you talk about linear programming a few days later you can go back and try to solve it and, and see whether you can get this uh, answer or not. Okay, so any question? Yeah. You want to use uh, the first this uh, reduction plan. Mm. Uh, so you will need some value of uh, uh, demand which will like to, to increase the present value of demand to some level. So that you should use At certain point it will come up, yeah, yeah? Uh, because there is a capacity constraint remember capacity is there. So, at certain point it will hit the capacity and then it is no more, you cannot produce from although, so certain in a plant there could be multiple ways you can produce steel. There are, if you go to Tata steel in Jamshedpur, you will see there are four, five, four blast furnaces I think. Now, all of them are on because each one of them have their own capacity and they want certain demand at the end. So, all four have to be on um, because you cannot exceed the capacity. Now here, the demand we have supplied is so much that one can have it, one can supply it. So now if I go and put the tight, put tightening on the C I think, C1 and C2, if I tighten, if I reduce, then some of the load will come to the other one. So it depends on all these, these parameters. These are other ways to verify as well, okay. Well, that is a good, good point, all right. So that actually completes the uh, assignment part. So what I would uh, ask you to do is make it fair and complete the process because I have just scribbled here a few things. I didn't complete it. I want you to complete it, but you may have to rethink some things and then complete it and submit it tomorrow. Okay. So that's how we will tomorrow when you come to the lecture class. Yeah. All right. So now we will go back to the time that we have. We don't have any time. We passed the time or half an hour more. So I'm going to take over some of the classes that uh, I lectures that I could not complete. So let's go from there. So we did the beer can. We did all of these. Okay, there are a few things left. So let's talk about it. So we we did up to here, right? Up to here. Okay, now. It will be very descriptive from now, so um, you just have to pay attention to what I am saying. Um, I mentioned to you that in practice, people from industry usually do not like or they have sometimes have a negative view about optimization. It is a common thing that I find, but, but the ideas are changing and I really thought hard, talked to people and figured out why there are certain reasons. You may think that the way I presented the whole thing to you in the morning is that optimization seems to be appearing in almost every area, right? But then the second question comes, if it is so important, why only four or five of you have taken an optimization class? Why is it not made compulsory to your curriculum, even an undergraduate curriculum, which I think they should. <laughs> uh, so I am actually promoting in many places, including my own university, to have optimization as a fundamental course like you do a numerical methods course, um, this should be because this is such an important and commonly used course everywhere. Um, but it is going to take a while to, to set, change the mindset. But I think that is one of the reason that much of our engineers getting out, getting a degree without any knowledge on optimization. So they have no idea of what this can do, what kind of, what are they used for actually. And so when they go and work in an industry, they have not much idea. They try to just solve a problem. Optimization, the word, or optimize is the word. 
probably most misused by people in, in technical area. You can hear even in television, you can hear big sharks giving talks and they say we optimize. I always raise my hand and I say, what do you mean you optimize? Most cases, they mean they have looked at one or two more solutions and whatever they implemented, they found to be better. So their whole search space is three solutions, okay? And out of the three, whichever is better, they're calling that is optimize. It's obviously not optimization, right? As the knowledge that you have a little bit, you have to look at all possible solutions. An optimal solution is the best ever possible solution. But you can never probably get there because of all the complexities that they have. But at least if you can get close to it and three solutions is not enough, then you are kind of, you know, heating it, heating the solution by chance. It's not possible, okay? Um, so that's, that's how they are misused, actually. But there are methodologies, as, as we'll be talking about, you'll see that uh, it's possible to be applied. Uh, but I, I also think there are more things about it. One is the lack of knowledge, okay? The second thing is, is that there are many things, even where you have taken a course in operations research or optimization as a part of another, they don't cover in detail, uh, they don't tell you the recent developments in the field. Like some of the things I have written here, multiple objectives, uncertainty, mixed integer. Unless you put all this into practice, the simple reason is this. Let's say you want to minimize uh, weight of a structure. So lightweight design is a buzzword in auto and many aerospace, of course, they have to do. But in many other uh, design scenarios in practice, lightweight design is something they want to do. So what do they mean by that? That means you have to minimize the weight of the design that you have. That's as simple as that. And then there are lots of constraints that allows the solution to be feasible. Um, so when you say lightweight design and you put as weight as the only objective and you design, what you are going to get? You are going to get a solution that every gram of material is well taken care and nothing is extra because you are trying to minimize. If you really get close to the optimum, you have a solution that squeezed out all the weights, extra weights and given you the bare minimum that's needed. Okay. So that solution will look very skinny, not much material here and there, just enough for the stress developed to be equal to strength, just satisfying all the constraints. If I give you an example of such a design, so for example, you've seen the swings in the parks that the kids, you know, swing by. Um, what is the weight of, let's say, even five kids, if you add up, if five kids are sitting on that swing, what will be the weight? Each, each kid may weigh like 40 kilos, let's say, at most. 40 times at 200 kilos, let's say 500 kilo. I've designed it for 500 kilos. If you design 500 kilo weight to be taken by two beams, okay, what will be the diameter of each? You can do that at home by considering these are steel or iron, cast iron or whatever, usually steel. Um, you will see the diameter will come probably one millimeter or even less for each of them. So we are talking about here like size of steel threads, that's enough to take 500 kilos. You can do that calculation yourself, okay, you'll see it. Now, that's the minimum lightweight design. Now, let's say I have no optimization so much, I have designed it and I fabricated it with one millimeter thin wear and I put this, would you put your, you know, sisters or brothers who are little on, onto that swing? You will first impression will have it's going to break. But no, mathematically or even with factors of safety is not going to break. It's a perception you have that before I use it, it has to be certain thickness, right? And that's the only reason they increase the thickness. So they don't use the lightweight design. They deliberately use more simply because of the perception that we have, okay? So that means not all the time we are looking for the lightweight design, although that's our purpose, okay? Certain things have to be looked in a certain way. Or I would put it another way. There are some other purposes. There are some other purposes. It's not just used for just 500 kilo weight. It could be something else. What is that could be? Huh? Exactly, exactly. So if it's such a thin thing and it's really taught, a little boy or girl 
folds it, is going to cut their hand, right? So, where is that objective? Did you put that as a constraint? No, we did not put, we just looked at the stress versus strain, uh, strength. Yeah, so there are many other things. How do you fabricate? Okay, so that is another thing. Uh, there are a lot of things people design, like for example, these transmission towers. You have seen where the high electricity, how high voltage wires go, they are like about 70, 80 meters long, tall. Have you ever thought how this was trans, uh, trans, uh, transported to those places? Had they transported in one piece? No, you can't be. Huh? Assembled. assembled on spot. So they've built it in parts and they assembled on, on, on spot. Okay. So that means, let's say I've broken them up into five pieces. So each piece is now needs to be transported. So how do you transport it? You put it on a truck, lay down, put it on a truck, and put some support, right? Okay. So you've designed the whole thing. That's safe. All the wind load every load that you have in taken into account and it is optimal in terms of weight. Now, when you are transmit, transporting it, it is not the whole thing, it is a part. And if you have not considered that loading case, that only this part has to be put on a truck under two support and there could be jerks that are coming from the road and other thing, that itself can break over there before you even reach the site. Have you considered that? Okay, they, they always consider that. Th those who are designing all this, they also take into account how this is going to be transported and all that. There was a funny, a funny story I should tell you because it's originated here. So when we were student here, there was a professor. His name I'm not going to tell you. Okay, he's retired now. So excellent teacher. You know, he used to teach us mechanics. So he would take a duster. Today's world, there is no chalk we use usually, so there is no duster usually. Uh, but there used to be duster, so he would um, use the duster for many things and duster he would use as a beam and he would put a lot of load into the duster saying I am loading it this way or that way, whatever. So he was very expressive. There was a pointer, wooden pointer that he would use because he would didn't use to come up and to the stage and show it by hand. He would stand there and show it with the, uh, with the pointer. Okay. And then when he's not showing at the pointer, because it's a 50 minutes class, he used to get tired. So he used to put that pointer behind and he used to just sit on it a little bit. Okay, somehow rest himself there. One day that broke because he was resting on it and he fell down and hurt himself a little bit. What's the first thing is I was sitting on the first bench. What's the first thing he said? Oh, who designed this? I, I have to stop buying from here. I have to ask the department not to buy any more pointers from them. And I was sitting there and thinking, is it really the pointer's fault? Was it designed, the designer of the pointer has ever thought that this is going to be used this way? <laughs> Probably not, right? But then this professor is blaming that company, okay? And that's the human nature, right? So you need to, being a designer, you need to sit and imagine what all possible way it will be used or misused. Okay? And unless you take care of each of those situations, it can fail and it could be disaster. Okay? It could be disaster. And then you have to take some of the blame because you don't know how people will take it. You can always go to court and say this was not designed for it. But you know, so if I design the pointer, why would I design it to take a load of a person? I mean like so much weight. You know, all I have to do is do this. But no, you have to think beyond. So that's what I'm getting at. Transmission tower is the same thing. It's not just that, okay, while you assemble it, then everything is fine. But how do you assemble it? You have to think all that. Um, so that makes a lot of things. So nothing in practice is one goal that only minimize the weight of the structure. There are so many other things that come in. And that's the reason the people from industry say, we don't like optimization because I give you an objective and you're going to use your algorithm and give me such a solution that it's such a specialized solution for that objective, which is could be weight, that I don't like it anymore because it's useless for any other purposes. Okay? They tired, they get tired, they say, Oh, we've tried optimization. It gives us something which we don't like. And then I'm asking why? I mean you you probably haven't put some constraints, but sometimes they cannot think beyond, right? And and so that's what happens. So Multiple objectives and, and multi scenario, con this is a multi scenario case actually, multi scenario optimization. All these are now commonly used in optimization, so which was not there maybe 10 years ago. So it is possible to do all that now. 
So these are some reasons why I think uh, uh, the industry people who are a little uh, old and tired of using single objective do not like. And, and that's why they say it. Uh, but I understand. I understand where they're coming from. And I always I say that, OK, there is a misunderstanding of what do you mean by optimization and what I'm going to give you through my optimization methods. And then I have to explain some more. And then things become a little, little more clear. Here in this plot, I'm showing you different figures here. I'm showing you the complexities that come in. On the top left here, this is a discrete search space. You see that there are only eight different solutions that are possible. And if I get their actual values, they need not be uniformly spaced. Okay? So I could have 1, then 2, then 5, then 6, then 8, then 10, then 12, something like this. They can be not coming in regular intervals. And, and this could be some numbers that are allowed. Only eight numbers are allowed. So you can, but you still see there is a minima, right? This is the minima. But if I plot every solution, then you see it. But you have to use an algorithm to find it. Okay, so then it becomes difficult. So these are called discrete <coughs> optimization problems. Here is a problem with discontinuities. You can see that there is a discontinuity here. That means if I come from right and I come from left, there are two different numbers. Same thing here. here. And the reason I... I believe that many, pro in fact, some of the problems I have solved with industries, I, I always see this kind of discontinuity. But there is a very nice paper written by a practitioner working on optimization. He surveyed a lot of papers on optimization and the properties of optimal solutions. His conclusion was that in majority of the problems, if there is a discontinuity in the problem, that means left, right do not match, or if you take higher dimensions, then you go from one dimensions, and you can apply the same thing. One dimension is you're going towards the point, optimum point. Um, you get one value. You come from the other side. You have another completely different value. It's called discontinuity. If there exists discontinuity in a problem, that paper, survey paper found out it actually happens at the optima. Here is an example. It's happening here, which is not an optima. It's happening here, not an optima, but it's also happening at the optima. And the reason for that in practical problems is this. Uh, we did a, I show you that example maybe a few days from now, uh, but it's a, it's a power, solar power design problem from Spain, Spain's power uh, company. Um, so they store the excess power. Okay? Now, if, this, if the excess power is so much, you have to use one device of that. If the excess power goes beyond that, you have to use two. Beyond certain number, you have to use three. So there are a lot of if then else kind of statements you face when you're solving practical problems. If this happens, then that. If not, then that. When that happens, you get into discontinuities. Because when you go from uh, two solar collectors to three solar collectors, there's suddenly an increase in cost, right? Because you have to now buy another one. And these are costly. So you need to suddenly spend a lot of uh, initial cost is more. So if you're now minimizing the cost, what happens is suddenly your cost goes up. And that's how you get the discontinuity. If you're slightly below this much excess power, you can do it two, and the, and the cost is less. If you go slightly more, you need three, and then you have to start over here. That gives you the discontinuity. See how the if-then-else can give you discontinuity. So anytime you face in your problem, there is an if-then-else statement in your constraints or objective function. You can imagine that, that, or you can think that there will be a discontinuity in my search space. This example here is a sketch for mixed variables. One va somebody asked me about the mixed variable constraints. So here is a sketch. This variable here, y, is continuous. When you fix x, this is continuous. As you can see, the objective function is continuously varying. Now, if you go to x1, it's not continuous. There are only few values that are allowed. And now you see every such line here, when you fix x, there is a continuity, but there is no continuity between these two different x values. So you see, this is my landscape. Somewhere there is a minima. I can't can even see from here, but somewhere there is a minima. So you have to work with this search space and go and find a solution near the minima. Right? So it gets difficult. Okay? This is a sketch for multimodality, where there are multiple solutions. This is my solution x1, x2 x3, x4, all four of them have very similar f, and you are maximizing here. Let's say maximizing efficiency, profit, or whatever. So, and these are different x values, so different solutions. If I find all these solutions, they will all look different from each other. 
but somehow they give the same kind of efficiency. So being a designer, I'm really interested now in knowing all the four solutions because currently I may be using this one. Tomorrow, if there is some, if this is emitting something to the environment and tomorrow the government comes up with a rule that says that much emission is not allowed, then I, I have other solutions to switch to. Or this requires some material that I have to import all the time. Tomorrow, the import costs have gone up or there is some issues in the import that I cannot get it. So I move to the next one. So if I know number of different solutions that gives me more or less the same performance that I'm looking for, I have the liberty here. I have the freedom to move around. So that's why multimodal solutions are very good. So this is a sketch for such a function. And oftentimes we see that in, pr in, in practice. This is the uncertainty stuff I was talking to you about. We'll talk about this more in detail later on. The, both these are uncertainty. Now, your actual objective function can be the solid line that I have here. Okay? So there is a local minima here, 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 maybe a little bit here and there. And this is the global min maxima, not minima, maxima. This is the global maxima. Right. So globally speaking, if you can find this solution here, x, this gives you the maximum efficiency, for example. Okay. But this solution, whatever solution is here, gives you that. If you can adhere to that, you get a nice design, nice performance. But if you are uncertain about it, let's say I asked you that the, the dimension of this thing should be 50 centimeter, but you have a way quality control on cutting that, that you can get plus minus 1 centimeter, let's say. So sometimes you're getting 49, sometimes you're getting 50.35, something like this, right? If such a small change makes your function drop so much, now when you get 49, you are not as good as that. So although you have used all your efforts to optimize, find that solution, but in practice you cannot adhere to it because you don't have a good quality control in your system, then you are really bad. And the engineers do not like this kind of solutions. Although it's an optimum, they would say, to hell with it, I don't want this. And this is another reason why they don't like optimal solutions because it gives you some solutions on the constraint boundary or in a situation like this that is too specialized for that particular solution. If you fluctuate a little bit from it, um, it's just not so good solutions. Rather, we'd be interested in this kind of solutions where even if it fluctuates by plus minus something, you are not deteriorating too much in the function value, right? So it's pretty stable. These are called robust solutions and these are called optimal, optimal solutions. And there is a affinity for practical people to go for robust solutions. So then the question is, how can you optimize and still find this and not that? I want to sacrifice global optima for robust solutions. So that's a big issue these days. Okay? But we have methodologies. We'll talk about them after the basic algorithms are done. Yeah? No, it's a different thing from sensitivity. This is like uh, I have some issues with what you gave me as an optimal solutions. I cannot implement what exactly what you said because I don't have control on my variables. right? There is always tolerances when I manufacture anything. Uh, and if you want, I can supply you those tolerances, and then you re-optimize. Okay? So the way we do these robust designs is you have to supply me how much you can, how much tolerance you can withstand. And then I'm going to give you a solution that is robust to that tolerance. Okay? So that's a little complex than just optimizing in general. So we'll talk about that uh, later next week. Yeah. No, um, that can also be done. So what he's talking about is, if we know how the objective function varies, can I find up to what tolerance this is still a best solution? Right? We can do that, inverse calculation and give. But remember, I'm showing you this. Uh, for a one variable problem, yes, I could take lots of points and plot this. But if you have 100 variable, I'll not be able to plot such a thing because it will require lots of solutions. To plot a function like this to see where the things are ro robust and where the things are global, it's an inf it's a enumerative search. It's it's like we am I'm searching the whole range, so it is going to take me years to, f to find that. When I do optimization, I don't look at many solutions, few solutions, and it takes me to the right place, right? But if I have to plot this for even three or four dimensional problem, I have to really create lots of lots of points 
and evaluate them, and that may take forever. So this is just for our understanding. You're saying that a problem may have this. But what you said about, uh, can you tell me a tolerance by which my global optimum will still become the robust? Yes, I can go and do some calculations and tell you that. But those are beyond the scope of this class, okay? but it's possible. But usually the way we do is not the inverse one, but the forward one, like you tell me that because you, are, you have a lead machine, you have a particular manufacturing process of producing this, right? So you tell me how much tolerance you have in your process, and I'm going to give you what is the robust solution and not the global solution, global optimal solution. Okay, this is an extension of that where I have constraints. Usually when you have constraints, we talked about, right, the constraints make uh, like 0, 0 solution infeasible. 0, 0 solution would be best for the objective function. So um, when you have constraints, your optimum usually lies on the constraint boundary, usually. Usually on the intersection of multiple constraint boundary. This is usually the case. Now this constraint actually comes and says you can't go right of that line because it's infeas infeasible. And this constraint says you cannot go left of that. So here is the intersection where both of them are uh, are kind of intersecting, and then your optimum usually lies there. Now, you have again used an algorithm, and you found these optimal solution with x1 and x2 value, and then you came and told me, hey, you told me this x1, this x2, but I cannot adhere to it. Every time I manufacture this, I have a fluctuation here. I have a fluctuation here, okay? Now, if you see now, with this fluctuation, if you produce this solution here and that solution here, you are here and you are infeasible. So look at this part. Almost 80% of the time here, you are in the infeasible region if you try to produce that. If you produce 100 solutions around it, 80 of, 80 of them are going to be infeasible solutions. So if it's a mass production you're doing, you thought that you're always doing optimum design, but 80% of them are even infeasible. Okay, so it's not very good if you have uncertainties. And that is another reason why in practice they don't like optimization, if you don't take into account uncertainties. But what I'm telling you is all these things we can handle with advanced methods of optimization. And we are going to talk about some of these in this course. So what is the solution to this? You simply go inside, right? And give him that solution, not this solution. So when you go inside, this is your feasible region. So when you go inside, now with this solution and that x1 and x2, with the fluctuations, now there is a cushion of feasible region you have around it. So not all the time you are infeasible. And now you come and say, hey, I know that I have some uncertainties in my system, but I can afford to have one in 100 of my products to be infeasible, but not more than that. So that means you want 99% reliability in your solution. So now the reliability-based design comes in. I'm not going to give you a robust solution. I'm going to give you a reliable solution, okay? which is this. So I will put my point in a way that only 1% of the time you are falling here or here and rest 99% of the time you're inside. If 1% is not good for you, like for aerospace applications, you may have to do one in a million can fail, okay? Then this point will go further up here. And now there's a bigger cushion you have, and maybe when 0.00001% of the time you are invisible. So once you tell me a reliability, I can fit that in my optimization algorithm, reformulate the problem, as a, as a problem of finding the reliable solution and give you the reliable solution. So you'll never get this kind of risky, unreliable solutions. And then the people in the industry would be happy because we've given them what they wanted, right? So all these are possible, but I'm just telling you by sketch here of that all these are possible, but I have not told you how. For that, I need first to talk about the optimization algorithms, okay? Uh, I'm going to skip some of these things, uh, but just to say that other kind of problem complexities you have in practice is very large dimensions. We've solved some problems where the search space has 100 to the power 315 to the power 10 solutions. Mm -hmm. This is the problem I'm going to talk about on the very last day, the New Zealand's land use management problem. So if you're thinking of making a sketch of the function, objective function, you need to evaluate so many solutions. Just to tell you how big that number is, in the whole universe we have 10 to the power 82 atoms including you, me, everywhere you see atoms, there are only this many. And we are talking about, you know, this is a small drop in that big bucket. Uh, it's impossible in your lifetime to evaluate each of these solutions and figure out where is the optimum. You have to use 
we are we are solving this so this problem took us about 12 hours to solve that's much less than a lifetime of a person but uh, we we don't guarantee that this is the optimum because in these problems we don't know where the optimum is but it's a pretty good solution than what they have been doing okay uh, sometimes the algorithms get terminated by that process is that you just go in until you are happy until you've ran out of patience until you ran out of time um, optimization has become so now used in in auto industries and others um, is that recently I was in one of the users group meeting again and um, Ford's R&D chief the, the Ford Motor Company that's R&D chief was giving a talk just before mine um, and he said that was a year ago and he said in six to ten years time they're working on it now there's a group of people whom he started that project is that after 10 years, 6 to 10 years, they are going to have a software where you just have to specify what is the engine power that you want. So you're going to design a car. Only specify what is the engine power and how much is the upper limit on the cost. That's it. These two numbers you specify, feed it to the computer. It will take one month. That's their goal. One month, then you don't touch that computer. And it has lots of processor, lots of things doing. At the end of one month, it will come up with he said one, which I didn't like, but he said one design of every nut bolt that requires to build a car. That's his goal. So you need to, sometimes when you're in a company, you need to set up such goals. And he's put at six to 10 years from now. And he started bringing in expertise and softwares, whatever is available. They started thinking in this way. Very minimal information, everything. So at the end, I asked him this question that you want a machine to tell you everything? And so the humans are out of the loop. Okay, so that's a dangerous thing, right? Then he agreed with me, and he may think his he may think slightly differently. Is instead of having one design coming out at the end, he may come up with four or five designs. That uh, ultimately a human will make a decision that which one out of them. So there will be some trade-offs that we'll have, and the human has to then make up a decision. But what I'm trying to tell you is uh, people in industry are thinking about that through the optimization route because that's the only way you can have an overall goal of optimization so everything i talked about here has to be built in which machine everything is going to be fabricated on their tolerances have to come in right multi objective has to come in so this is the, so you can see how fast this whole thing is going and how important that is in industry um, I think I ran out of time, but let me see. One or two more slides I'll go in before. So this is already I mentioned. This is sort of a sketch of a, of a typical, I've solved too many industry problems to see this, is that if I show you this function, x is the, x is the variable, let's say one of the variables, and fx is the, if you keep every other variable fixed, just very x, very x, and what is the function value, in this case maximizing. If you see a problem with this kind of function, where do you think is the optima? It's maximizing. maximizing. It's, in the it's in the middle, right? It's right in the middle. Uh, now, look at the function. Now, you look at the solid line. Okay, that's the objective function. There are massive multimodality. Okay, there are lots of lots of optima you see here, right? Local, local, maxima. Okay, so if you are using an algorithm that's just finding any local optima, you can get stuck in even, even over here, the lowest one. And your algorithm is, hey, I found the maxima. Because if I look around me, there is nobody better than me. And your algorithm will terminate. So that's not a good algorithm for solving this practical problem. A good algorithm should look at this problem as a dashed line here that I've shown. They should try to look at the mean of what's going on. Where is the main? improvement that's are happening not local little bit improvements okay so some of the classical methods are very myopic like this they can only look at a very small region they always look at gradients and stuff like that right various uh, points very near to where you are currently then you can miss the big picture okay so there's always this kind of uh, trade off between local versus global so we need an we need an algorithm and, and, and so an algorithm that can see this function as the middle part being the main interesting region will win eventually. So we have done some problems in the past where 
these kinds of things are there. So, I am going to talk to you about this car suspension design later. Okay, so, I think let me stop that instead of going over. There are a few more slides left, but I am going to start with them um, in the next class. So, let me see there are uh, yeah, yeah, not many including the NFL theorem. And there are 5, 6 slides left. So, which we will start with tomorrow, finish that part and then move to some optimality theories. Okay, so, as I said, uh, the best way to uh, be with me every class and also take the maximum out of the course is uh, take a break now and then have dinner and after that maybe 2 or 3 of you are staying close together. Just go over the slides one time. Okay and then solve the home assignment problem, keep it ready tonight and then tomorrow you come and we will start again the new topic and you do that. So, that is how every day you prepare a little bit, that is the best way. Any question ask me tomorrow, okay? All right.